Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Oticon seminar, proudly sponsored by Oticon, the hearing aids of choice. Uh, so, uh, today we have uh, Dr. Michael Stone, who's a uh, senior research fellow who's uh, newly joined us. Uh, we've been here about a month now, four weeks ago. Four weeks, great. Uh, and prior to that, uh, uh, Dr. Stone worked at uh, Cambridge University. Uh, his background's in uh, engineering, specializing in electronic engineering. And you're going to talk to us today about uh, speech intelligibility and factors that determine speech intelligibility. Thanks very much. Thanks, Piers. And I'm sorry for turning you down a week ago because I had, uh, something cropped up in the family and I had to go away for that and I had to cancel the meeting. Um, this looks a bit like Logo Bingo on here because I used to work in Cambridge with Christian Fulgraber and Brian Moore. So some of this, most, all this work that I'm reporting today was done there. But I now have two, of, two hats, um, Manchester and also CMFT. So let's think about um, masking of a signal. That is, when a signal becomes obliterated by its surroundings. So I've got a visual analogy here. And people talk about cocktail parties. Um, as being a typical place where you have the great difficulty. And uh, maybe many of you students don't actually go to cocktail parties <laughs> these days. But they were all arranged in about 1951 when Colin <laughs> Cherry uh, coined the phrase about cocktail party, the cocktail party effect. How do we cope when there's a lot of multiple sources coming from multiple directions? So I've got this target sentence here. So I'm using this as a visual analogy. And what you could regard is that you could get some sort of um, energetic masking that reduces the neural contrast and makes that signal harder to see. Now, that's energetic masking, but one way is that maskers don't, aren't always steady all the time. So they can actually have fluctuations in that. And in here, you might call this modulation masking, that there are fluctuations which interfere with the fluctuations in the target that you're trying to look at. And here, I've deliberately chosen fluctuations which do not contain any semantic um, attachment or distraction from the speech. So it's a purely what we might call a modulation master. And finally, we might have something which we call informational master, the masking. And we've got two messages here, like the, um, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy uh, dog, oh, and the cow jumped over the moon, which have got both fluctuations, but they've also got semantic interference possibilities with the target speech. So this is the sort of three forms of masking I want to be talking about today. Energetic, modulation, and informational masking. So let's transfer this to the auditory domain, which is where we're more familiar. So what people have traditionally thought of as energetic masking is something like a steady noise. Ah, that's one thing. OK. I'll have to do an approximation to it. Oh. No, that's just that's not going to be much use. <laughs> okay, let's 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 do let's do some energetic masking. Okay, so that's energetic masking. The next thing you might have is when that that energetic masker has fluctuations in it. So instead of going, it goes, and then you have short gaps in there in which you might be able to listen into those gaps and try and detect the target message. I live in hope. Yeah. <laughs> um, naivety on that one. Um, OK, right. So then uh, the third form, which you might have, is actually where you have an interfering talker with informational masking. So if Piers here starts um, uh, um, saying, say a nursery rhyme or something like that, Piers. <laughs> 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 it's a nursery rhyme. OK, well, yes, what were you taught us in Australia? Right, so <laughs> somebody's gone camera shy here. Um, kookaburra, six. Right, so here we have that I'm trying to be the target masker, and we have an interfere there. So there we have informational masking. If you think, if you think that Australian, if you think that Australian English contains information, that is. Okay, so if we were to actually present a. Um, a speaker against these sort of background noises, we find that actually the performance of the intelligibility of the speaker varies according to the sort of background noise we have, even for the same sort of level. So what I had here was what we call a steady noise, this type of thing. 
And what you find is that actually, even at minus four decibels, target to background ratio, which is up in the top left hand corner here, it's really quite hard to hear that in the speech through that type sound. But when you actually have the modulated noise, then you can actually glimpse into the gaps and you actually do better. And then when you have the, the interfering talker, you've got gaps in there, but you've also got the interference. So when you actually sort of perform measures on people, what you find, this is normal hearing um, speakers, is that good performance on this plot is downwards. And we're plotting basically the speech reception threshold. That is, when do you get 50% um, of sentences correct? What sort of signals to noise ratios can you operate at? So if you have a negative signal to noise ratio, that means the noise is more intense than the signal. And the more negative the noise, the more negative the signal to noise ratio, that means there's more noise and less signal. So you're doing really well. So down is good on this graph. And what you see in a stationary noise, that type sound, you typically see a performance level of about minus 5 dB. And when you have a modulated noise, you actually end up around about minus 10 or minus 11 dB, which is an improvement of about 7 dB, which is really very good. And when you have an interfering masker, sometimes you can be more negative and sometimes you can be slightly less negative. But because if you think about it, uh, a modulated mask has got both energy and modulation, so it technically combines both energetic and modulation masking. And an interfering mask, because it has energy, it also has fluctuations and it has information. It has all three in there. But as we categorize it like that, what you see is that basically these dips that we have in either modulated or interfering mask are actually beneficial to the listener. And this is where we come to the sort of the applied part of this work, because at first it was all rather theoretical. But when traditionally, when we look at hearing impaired people and give them these sorts of tests, either in steady, modulated, or interfering noise, what we see is that actually the, the hearing impaired people just have the same performance as they have on a steady noise. They don't seem to be able to make use of these fluctuations. So if you've got a difference in performance between normal hearing and hearing impaired people, this looks like the holy grail. If we can get them to listen into the dips, then that means we've solved the problem of hearing impaired. So this has been a big research area for about the past, certainly for about the past 10 to 15 years as to sort of why do normal hearing get benefit from this fluctuation and hearing impaired don't. And in fact, if you've got time to look at the Bernstein and Grant paper, JASA 2009, fantastic thing about how there's one reason, which is that people haven't run the hearing impaired and the normal hearing at the same point. So there's, an, there's a methodological problem. But what I'm going to show today is that actually, if you, having said that there appears to be a difference between normal hearing and hearing impaired people, and saying that the hearing impaired people can't benefit from the fluctuations. What I'm going to claim today is that actually normal hearing people can't benefit from the fluctuations. Okay? And there's going to be a, a reason why by the end, hopefully. Okay. So here's a sort of typical performance type measure that we take um, by my colleague Christian Fulgarver, but this time good performance is up on the scale. And down in this bottom right hand corner, he's been presenting constants against a steady against the background noise, and you get an intelligibility of about 55%. But as you introduce the fluctuations into the noise, but have the same noise power, you find that intelligibility rises. They appear to be able to listen into the gaps. So this is called masking release, that for the same level of energy, you've got more intelligibility, so you've got a release from the masking, the masker isn't so effective. And you see a sort of an optimum but for fluctuation rates between about 4 and 32 hertz, where you get to the maximum intelligibility and apparently maximum benefit from the dips. So, <coughs> let's go back to looking at this thing which we've been calling up to now a steady random noise, a <coughs> type sound. And if we actually put it through an auditory filter, restrict the bandwidth to it, we actually see that it doesn't have such, you think that's fairly steady, but actually you start seeing that when you go through an auditory filter, you start seeing that actually there are short-term fluctuations which make the noise look a bit spiky. And I've actually given you there about six or seven seconds of a time waveform, so it's squeezed everything up. When you go down to explode up to look into about a second, what you see is there are these quite short-term fluctuations in level of the noise. So let's start looking at you know, then we have the energy, which is the green part, but then we have the fluctuations, which is sort of like the, the, the bits that are going up and down. So let's look at some more formal definitions of this. So if you take an audio signal and split it through a bandpass filter, such as happens on the basal membrane, you have a low frequency centered one, middle frequency, and a high frequency one. And this is actually taking a speech signal. 
And what you see is that you get a sort of a hairy signal like this, which gradually increases in fluctuation rate as you go up in frequency. And that's what we call the carrier. So the fine structure of the carrier. So if you think about it, just me producing a vowel, a, there's no temporal fluctuation, but it's just producing this sort of hairy structure across frequency. And it's only as I start moving my mouth up and down, um, and sort of, uh, I don't know, I can't remember my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of it. Um, as, I start move, as I start moving my mouth up and down, you actually you keep speaking at the same um, level and keep on voicing, but actually it's the fluctuations of my mouth which are causing the level, the short term level of those different bands to change, which gives me the information. So these modulations, which we sometimes call the short term fluctuations, they're noted in the black line, these modulations we call the envelope. And they are actually very important for carrying information to the brain. Because if I just went, a, there's no real information there all the time. And it's just the onset and the offset of that which really gives you the information. It's the fluctuations which really give you the information longer term. The carrier, the fine structure stroke carrier, does do other things, and there's a big debate about that, but we're not going to touch on that today. So, but both information carried by envelope and fine structure Mainly the envelopes are what we're going to be interested in today. So, so we're having used this phrase steady, let's go back to steady. If you wanted a steady energetic masker, if you think you'd take a steady noise and extract its envelope, you find that actually it's actually very fluctuating all over the time. But if you wanted a really steady noise, that really by definition steady means it's a constant energy over all time, you'd have something like that. And the only thing that really produces that is a sine wave. Just it's narrow in frequency and it's got <coughs> negligible fluctuation. And if you then wanted to introduce dips into it, we could then put a sinusoid onto that to make that sinus that um, sinusoid fluctuate. So it's going up and down in level. And we've been playing around and trying to do some masters which don't have this sort of fluctuation, but have this sort of steady envelope. So one way we started off with this is by taking 28 sinusoids equally spaced on the perception scale, the ERB scale, and what we're going to do is we're going to filter speech into 28 bands, and for each of those bands we're going to have a masker, which initially is a sinusoid, and you can see I've got alternate colours, alternate sinusoids and alternate col colours. So every band of speech that we have will always have a sinusoid or a masker paired with it to try and obliterate that band of speech. So in this original experiment, what we did, we had sinusoids, and then we used a narrow band of noise. Now, it's particularly the auditory isn't, isn't working, but a, a narrow band of noise is a, it's a very squeaky sound, which has, seems to have a sort of tonal characteristic, but it's a bit rough in tonal characteristic. But it's, the thing about that is that it, because it's a narrow band of noise, it doesn't have very much bandwidth and therefore not very much modulation in it or very low modulation rates. And then what we also did was to have one er wide bands of noise. So we could actually, so we've stepwise approximated the long term spectrum of the speech that we're going to use to, to obliterate with this. So we've got several different choices of maskers that we've got there. And those masks are going to be matched, they're matched to the overall spectral shape of the speech we're going to mask. And then we've got a, a subtle trick here. Because what we can do is, you notice I've done these bands in different colours. What we can do, if you think of all the bands as lined up like this, what we can do is we take alternate bands and present them to one ear and the other bands to the opposite ear. And that's called a dichotic presentation. And of course, when you put that band of master, its associated speech band goes with it. So half the speech bands and the noise bands go to one ear, and the other half go to the other ear. Or we can just present both to the same ears. Okay. Now at first, you might think there might be a penalty for putting half the bands to one ear and half to the other, because you've got to rely on the central combination. And as things move from one frequency band to another, they're going to actually be hopping ear and doing funny things like that. So you might think there's a big penalty. <coughs> we were surprised. Now, why do we want to do this? Well, if you put, to consider just five sinusoids, uh, that's why, let's, let's take five sinusoids centered around about one kilohertz, and this is in the frequency scale on that, and we put them through an auditory filter. Um, they were originally sort of equal level in the, before they went through the auditory filter, but once they go through the auditory filter, it's got rid of them because the auditory filter is shaped like this. 
But when you actually look at the time waveform of that bunch of sinusoids, you actually see that it's not got a very steady envelope. It's actually fluctuating quite mad. Whereas, if we do our trick where we put the alternate bands to each ear, then when we pass these bands through an auditory filter, the side bands are quite a long way down, so you actually see comparatively less intermodulation, less fluctuation in the So We have a near steady masker that we can use to obliterate that one band. Okay? And then the alternate bands, the ones that are missing, these two that are missing, they'll be going to the opposite ear. So, I showed you that picture with this fluctuation in the envelope here, and no fluctuation there. So let's sort of compare them for this sort of masker that we're going to be using. So what we're now going to do is measure the, the frequency of the modulation. So you have to be careful here, because this is a slightly different scale. This is the modulation rate, the envelope fluctuation rate. And you know that you can't hear down, you can't hear the 100 hertz pure tone very easily. We're talking about the fluctuations that are going on top of that. So that's why we call it modulation rate rather than frequency to try and distinguish them. Okay. And what you see is that for the dialectic presentation, where you've got all the sinusoids going to one ear, it gets really quite rough and you get a lot of modulation products at different frequencies. And we're here, this is just looking at the bottom eight channels, but it's basically you get an awful lot of this array, modulation energy, going into the ear, which is causing going to cause you problems. Whereas if you do this dichotic presentation where you have the alternate sinusoids going to each ear, what you see is that within each ear, you actually get very, this black bit here is where the modulation energy rises. So we managed to clear it out by and large from large areas of the modulation spectrum. So we've got, we've produced a masker which is what we, more closer to our definition of energetic, and that is it's got very little fluctuation in the envelope if we use this dichotic presentation technique, alternate bands to each ear. So, now, there's one other trick that we did in this experiment. Um, was where I talked about those narrow bands of noise, which was sort of like a very, very whistling type of noise. And the standard sort of Gaussian noise that you expect, like the fan noise from that thing up there, it will have this sort of shape if you sort of do a short-term time analysis of it. But there is a, a technique that somebody came up with in 1985, which is called low noise noise where it's mathematically quite hard to, um, to think of initially, but actually once you've done it, it's quite easy. And if any of you have done the 10 test, and you've been doing the latest version of the 10 test, um, it actually uses low noise noise to do a little trick on the CD. But basically, low noise noise is a noise band which has exactly the same spectrum, the same spectral width, but we, we adjust all the components ever so slightly in time until we minimize the fluctuation of the envelope. So it sounds more like a sort of a warbling tone going up and down in frequency um, with a slight fluctuation in the envelope. So it's got the same energy spread as the noise, the Gaussian noise, but it has much less envelope fluctuation. And so when you look at the envelope of that, compare the Gaussian noise envelope to a low noise noise envelope, you see there's much less fluctuation in the low noise envelope compared to the Gaussian noise envelope. Ignore those two panels just for dynamic purposes. So, so what we then do is we're going to run a speech intelligibility experiment. Sentences, the IEEE sentences if you know them, uh, and the birch canoe slid on the smoothest planks. So five key words per sentence. Um, we have 16 young normal hearing subjects, and we use two target to background ratios of signal to noise. Well, sorry, we didn't want to use the phrase signal to noise because the noise is varying between gas and low noise and so on. The target to background ratio minus 5 or minus 10 dB, where you normally would expect to see these sort of fluctuation effects <coughs> if you use this masking release. And so what we do here is do a sentence intelligibility test, just measure how many words do they get right when we present the mask up either with a sinusoid or way across low noise noise, third of an herb wine, or, or gas in noise. That's the so, so basically that's, as you go across here, what you're seeing is that the the width of the noise bands is increasing and the roughness is much more in them with Gaussian compared to the low noise noise. And what you see, basically, as you increase the bandwidth of the noise masker in each band, or you increase the envelope fluctuations, intelligibility drops. Michael, sorry to interrupt, was the um, speech diotic 
No, this is, these, these are all the dichotic results. Sorry. So the speech is dichotic and the mask is yes. dichotic. Yes. So for every for every mask band, there's a speech band, and they, they always travel together to the relevant ear. So you get speech plus mask. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. quite a lot of so, so, so this this trick you were doing, explaining that that happens to speech as well as so, the yes, mask. right. Yes, so that every every speech band is always being obliterated by a mask band. You never get a chance okay. to listen to it um, clear, cleanly. Okay, so you're seeing this, and then so when you get to minus five, dec minus ten decibels in the noise, the sinusoid masker isn't being very effective, but the you virtually wiped out, and um, it's a bit dispiriting trying to get subjects to do it, but only performing down at about two to ten percent, but. Um, you pay them enough and they'll do it on that one. Okay. So that is for all the maskers when they're what we call notionally steady. There's no fluctuations in them that we've impressed on it. We haven't got any big dips on them. So what we then did was then put an 8 hertz um, modulation on, or either on all these different maskers and then re-measured the intelligibility. So 8 hertz is sort of chuffing type effect, that's, that's with the noise effect. So it's about that sort of rate that, um, that and so we've got little dips to listen into, about 60 milliseconds. And then we then repeat the same experiments. And this is again all dichotic. And again, what we see is that intelligibility decreases as you either increase the bandwidth of the noise or increase the envelope fluctuations, as in that. But when you compare it against the steady master, what you see is that for say this one here, that actually get more intelligibility when you've got these fluctuations in it. So you think, oh, I've got masking release, I've got benefit from the fluctuations in the masking. And the same for all these, they're all being much better. And it looks the same here, that you've got much higher intelligibility when we have those eight hertz dips in it. Dip listening, masking release, fluctuating mask benefit. Okay, so let's look at the actual benefit, the difference between the score in the steady noise compared to this twin in the fluctuating noise for all these um, experiments. So this is what's called the fluctuating mask benefit. The difference, how much release from masking, how much extra intelligibility do you get when you have these fluctuations? And what you see for a consistent pattern of both target and background ratios, that actually as the bandwidth of the noise goes up or the envelope fluctuations increase, you get more masking release. Okay? This is still for the dichotic presentation. Now, <coughs> let's go back and repeat the same experiment, this time with all the mask bands to both ears. What would you be doing in a normal environment like this on the same task? And how much release from masking would we get? And what you find, so these white bands are either the sinusoid in dietic or the Gaussian noise in dietic. And what you see, su surprisingly, well, uh, well, let's just start at the set. Let's see, start at the set. So here we, we, we presented our, with our energetic masking trick with the odd bands and even bands of each ear. We got no release from masking. Whereas when we do the conventional experiment, we get, as we expect, a release from masking. But the only difference between those two conditions is whether you put all the bands to one ear or just the alternate bands. And the only difference is the fluctuations that you're getting within each auditory filter. So that effect is explainable by the fact that you put more, that there's more roughness in the original signal here when you've got all the bands going to both ears. But actually, if you can get rid of that roughness, then they don't benefit. So this traditional masking release that everyone's been searching for and that they've seen in normal hearing people is actually caused by the interference of the masker inside the auditory filter. And if you can get rid of that and make it truly steady, you see nothing happening. You don't get any release from masking. So you end up with this slightly bizarre thing, that if you have a steady mask up all along, and present that against speech, that you, you measure intelligibility with that. Then you have the alternative, where you put in big dips at about 8 hertz, where, when you think about it, in those troughs, then the speech should be really clear above the values. You, can't, you, can't, you don't benefit from it. I mean, there's a slight bit of extra masking when the peaks of the mask come up. You've got this really clear gap where well, well, you've got dug out a valley in the mask and you should be able to hear the speech and you don't benefit from it. And the only thing that you're really benefiting from is the release from the fluctuations in the mask which is what's happening there. So it's a trade-off between the, the fluctuations you've got in the mask compared to the dips that you're putting in when you're impressing the 8 hertz modulation. Okay, is 
So we've got every OK at that point. So, so what we've shown basically is that at, for an 8 hertz modulator, there's no such thing as modulation masking noise. That if you have a purely, there's no release from energetic masking. But an energetic masker is the best, the, the easiest masker to listen into. And putting any sorts of fluctuations in it just messes up the listener. Okay. So I said earlier that I'd show that um, masking release doesn't exist in normal human people. It doesn't in this condition. It appears to exist here, but that's a release from modulation masking, not from the energetic masking. So, Mark, so you're going from uh, when you you go from the sine dichotic to the sine diotic, yeah. right? And the sine dichotic is, is meant to be more steady and the, and yeah. the sine diotic is it's got the fluctuations. Yes. And you're but getting, but you've and you've, and you've chopped the spectrum, the speed spectrum up, so the, the alternative bands. Right, it. right. So, so the difference you're getting then between those two conditions, which looks like a masking release for sine diotic, mm -hmm. which I suppose on first <laughs> prima facie might be um, regarded as, as something to do with fluctuations. You're saying that's actually due to the diotic presentation. Well, it's, just, it's due to the fluctuations in the mask which are reduced by the, the dichotic. But you're getting right. a masking release for that yes, one. Yes, because you, but you're getting a release from the, the fluctuations you've introduced in the mask. So, um, it's beginning, there's, there's more fluctuations in the, in the mask than the diotic case. Yes. And you're getting a, a better performance in that situation. Well, you know, you appear the change between the steady and the fluctuation. You appear to get a benefit, but in fact, okay. when, All right. when, okay. when you go back to this one, what you see is that in the sinusoid, the steady sinusoid, the really steady yeah. dichotic presentation, okay. you're in maximum intelligibility, and everything else is downhill from there on in. So, so when you start putting modulations in. You don't get any increase up there. In fact, you're nearly saturated. So, but even there, you don't get any increase. But, but that, but that, or it, I'm, I'm still kind of. Uh, okay. um, <laughs> I mean, it, it just, it just seems. I mean, if, if you compare, so, so the top. So, if we go from the nominally steady to the. So, so the, the diotic ones aren't on this. The, the, the diotic ones aren't on that one. Right? Okay, but if you, if you had just the diotic sign versus the dichotic sign. Um, you'd find that in the steady condition, you actually get less. Okay, all right, sorry. So you then get a release as you go up that way. Okay. Yeah, yeah so that is, masking release can be a bit if you, um, you know, this is sort of what's your baseline, but it's, it's this one that is really powerful to say, you're up at maximum with a steady sign side, and anything you do to it, you either stay the same right. or you go, okay. yeah. you go down. Um, so, so when you get a masking release, what you're doing is you've already crippled them by giving them noise or uh, fluctuations, mm. and you put in the eight hertz fluctuations, and they improve in intelligibility. So, it's just releasing them from the, the garbage that you put into the masker is quite often. Okay, so we've shown this at eight hertz. So, shown that modulation, that release from masking, if it does occur, is released from modulation masking, not from energetic masking. But okay, that happens at eight hertz. What happens at other modulation rates, because speech comprises a multitude of modulation rates from about 1 hertz up to about 60 to, well, maybe 200 if it's female speech. So we repeated the experiment. Okay, so, yes, just, just trying to emphasize there's no masking release for truly steady noise. Okay, uh, now this is where I was going to, <laughs> could do it. If you've, got 20, if you've got 28 people here, you can do this. Where everybody whistles at the side of the side. <laughs> okay, so what I've got here um, is it was actually a comparison between the mask we're going to use and these 28 sinusoids. We're going to chuck away the noise now, we're not really interested in it. Um, because we've now got this energetic mask that we know got, we can have very low fluctuations. So we're really interested in that because that's the most efficient, inefficient mask we've got because it's really easy to get things in there. And so I'm just going to compare the two. Actually, what it sounds like is like somebody's got their hand on an organ and it's just steady all the time. It's really quite irritating because actually gas, that sort of noise is actually quite soothing, quite restful. If you're listening with somebody playing an organ at a constant level all the time, it's really quite, it does blow into you, especially if some of the negative signal to noise ratios you have blocked right down. So my hat, go off to, my hat goes off to the people who did this experiment. Um, but it is, so it is quite drilling, and there's the su subtleties when you switch to the sound sound from the Okay, so. So first off, what we're going to do is we're going to do the traditional experiment where we look at our baseline, which is where we do diotic presentation. The conventional experiment we're going to have is inharmonic organ presented to both ears, all bands, 
to both ears, masking speech, the same sort of speech as we had before, I keep doing sentences. And again, Dan is good, but I'm plotting, I'm not plotting intelligibility percent this time, I'm plotting the SRT, that's the speech reception threshold, for getting 50% correct. So they do an adaptive track, so you present the sentence, they get five right, you make it harder, they get two of, or one right, you make it easier, and you gradually do an adaptive track, estimate actually is a 60% point, estimate the slope, and then you can infer the 50% point. So what you see is when you've got no modulation, the truly steady sinusoids presented diotically, you see they're doing up around about minus 9 dB. Put in the fluctuations as before, and you get better, you can cope with more intense noise, you can listen into the dips. And Similarly, these are slightly less than that. In fact, statistically they're not, but in fact, I've got the, um, I've got a bit of In fact, these three are statistically significant lower than this. So therefore, if I were to use either a 1, an 8, or a 16 hertz mask, fluctuation on the master, you get the ability to cope with more, a higher level of background noise. So that's our traditional release from masking. So great, we've repeated the standard experiment that everybody does. So now, let's go back to our trick of presenting the alternate sinusoids to each ear. So, the Arctic presentation, we get the mas masking bridge doesn't exist. We get, apparently, yes. So this time, we're going to do the alternate bands to each ear, the dichotic. And what you see, just ignore that for the moment, what you see is that by moving the bands, alternate bands to each ear, rather than both, also all bands to both ears, you actually get better. You get about near a 2 dB improvement in noise that you can cope with and you're actually doing really quite phenomenally well at minus 11 dB compared to the sort of minus 4 dB you would have with the sort of Gaussian noise type of noise. And then what you see is that as you introduce the fluctuations like 1 hertz, the really, and these are really slow. If you think about it, it's a fluctuation over a second. It's actually really quite slow. And I did actually have, and I've seen the previous one, it's in the previous one, I did actually have some noise like this. But it is really very slow, which it changes it. But actually, when you go to higher rates, 2 hertz and higher, you actually see that you're having to have either the same noise or slightly less noise. So you're not being able to listen into the dips with that. So again, you've got a, this masker is nearly the most efficient, although you appear to do a bit better than this 1 hertz, so you can listen into it. But then the 1 hertz gaps are about 500 milliseconds long. And in fact, it's whether you really pick up half a word and virtually clear or not. So it depends where the what the phasing of that is. So it's actually, um, you're not really sort of glimpsing suddenly into a dip and making, sort of getting a small time frequency window and going, oh, I know what I'm going to do with that. It actually has to be quite a long thing that you're glimpsing into. So here, apparently we do get a release from masking, but only around one hertz. Now, this, is a, this next graph, although it looks similar, it's got a subtle point in it. Same thing for the modulation rates. I said we measured the um, speech reception threshold at 50%. What we also do is we measure the intelligibility function, the slope of it, so that as we've got signals of noise there, but as we make the reduce the uh, noise, as in the more positive signal to noise ratio, intelligibility rises. So we can infer, we know what that slope is from all the, the adaptive track that we took, we can infer what that slope is. And we do it, we, make, we report that slope for all these different modulation rates. And what you find is that when you've got the steady noise, the slope of that function is really quite steep. But then as you go to 1 hertz, it shallows off quite normally, and then it comes up again as it goes to these higher rates. And this has an important uh, impact on that. So that shows that those slopes are pretty similar for when you did dietic or dichotic. Because if you actually plot out the, the measured um, performance intensity functions here, so what we've got here is that steep and sloping, unmodulated performance intelligibility function. And here we have the modulated what one hertz intelligibility function. And what, so if we measure our 50% performance level, what we see is that we get to a lower, more negative, better signal to noise ratio for the one hertz modulation. So we get a, so we get a release from mask that we can cope with a more negative signal to noise ratio compared to our unmodulated mask up there. So conventionally we're getting that dip where we appear to get. Um, benefit from the fluctuation we've introduced. But look at this thing about the slope, is that actually, as you, if you were to change your performance measure from 50% higher, what you find is that these things gradually converge. So that 
when you get to about 75%, you find that the intelligibility for whether you've got one hertz fluctuation or no fluctuation is the same. That is, you're not being able to make use of the dips. So our argument in the paper that's appearing in um, about a month or two is that actually, if you think about it, if you were operating in an environment where you were only picking up 50% of the words, you'd soon leave that environment. It's not, an, it's not a cocktail party you can survive in for very long. Whereas something like 70, if you're going to 70 to 80% of the words, you'd probably stick it out. It'd be quite hard work, you'd probably stick it out. But actually what we're showing, if you, you take that as being a, what's a socially acceptable criterion for intelligibility, actually, we're still seeing no masking release, even with the very slow fluctuations that we have there. So, you know, so if we actually plot the difference between these curves, what we see is that if you have really negative signal to noise ratios between the, this between the one, zero hertz and one hertz, then you do actually get the release from masking because of, because of the shallower functions, the difference in the slopes. But actually, at least about minus 9 dB and above, you don't appear to see any um, uh, release from masking. So, you know, if release from energetic masking does happen. It happens at about around about one hertz, and only for impossibly a really low performance levels, where you're just, um, you probably wouldn't stay in there very long. So it's not really a practical thing that you can take benefit from. OK, so this, again, well, I don't know if it, it's a little bit of time. Um, I'll probably I'll skip that one. There's a subtle thing there. So basically, what we've previously called a steady background noise, a type noise, behaves primarily as a modulation mask. It's interfering with the fluctuations in the speech. And if you can suppress them, such as these big dips, then you actually get a release from that mask. You introduce a, a, a modulator, and that's producing modulation masking, but you've suppressed all the other tiny fluctuations, which gives you a chance to glimpse at the, at the target speech, and you do better. So steady background noise is behaving as a modulation mask, not an energetic mask. And <coughs> masking release, that is the ability to benefit from fluctuation, if you're measuring with a truly energetic mask, only happens at very, very low modulation rates. And so what has conventionally been defined as masking release, remember this is the thing that people are searching for with hearing impaired people as the why they appear to exhibit masking release, is because it's a release from modulation rather than energetic masking. And we've produced some figures in the paper which say that basically the modulation effect, for the same energy, the modulation is producing about 7 dB more masking than the energetic masking. So it's actually quite an enormous contribution to the masking to the fluctuations. So, and this is sort of the slightly more academic thing, is that previously there have only been definitions of energetic and informational masking. And some people have said, well, this is a bit too big a basket to put everything into, maybe there's another class. So, um, and uh, that's people like Dermak talking about that back in about 2004. And we propose that actually we need to put this into speech, the speech masking phrases and we need to consider what the modulations are. Um, so the implications are the fluctuations in the mask are more deleterious than the energy. And this is the applied bit. Because if you think about what's going on in a hearing aid, a hearing aid is taking a signal, which is quite complex, multiple sources in the environment, and it's adjusting the gain of it over a short term time scale. So it's modulating it with a gain signal because the gain is saying, oh, it's a bit too loud, turn it down, a bit too quiet, bring it up. And that gain signal is actually related to whichever is temporarily dominating the signal. So the gain signal you're applying is related to something in the mix, but also it's a modulator. And when you modulate things, you produce other modulation energy at different modulation rates. So, and what we're, if what we're saying from here is true, that the modulations are really causing people problems, some of the things in hearing aids, which are adjusting things in, on the short term, may actually be, be causing problems to the hearing impaired because it's interfering with their modulation processing. So that's the applied take home message. And it's not only in automatic volume controls, because if you think about a directional microphone, the directional microphone is suppressing frequency bands where it thinks that things are coming from off from the side. So it's putting a, a modular, putting a gain on that band that's coming from the side. But again, part of what the mix of what you're receiving, you're receiving some short-term modulations which are likely to be uh, distracting you from detecting the target. 
and it's a question that is covered, that covers, well, what sort of rates are deleterious and which ones can we get away with? So that's the sort of, sort of, the, sort of future work of saying what's... It's, you obviously have to have automatic volume controls to make a hearing impaired person have audibility. You obviously have to have adaptive directional microphones to really help them in tough listening situations. But the question is how fast do you make them before you start putting in too many micromodulations which then start interfering with what they're trying to target. Okay. Uh, so that's sort of basically some of that stuff that function like so. Yes, there are a couple of things we want to do. Um, um, and one of the ones is, actually this is just purely temporal modulations. And of course vowels have forms which drift, so they have spectral modulations. So one thing would also be to characterize a bit better, so that as, as we vary the ripple rate, not just in time, but also we can vary this user's technique to vary the ripple rate in frequency. So um, upward moving energy, downward moving energy, um, and see if there's anything around about this one hertz. And, and, and trying to characterize that area a bit better. Because there is a paper um, in PLOS by Elliot and Turnison from Berkeley where they actually were characterizing the ripple rates in cycles per kilohertz. And if you know your auditory perception, then you'd really think of it as cycles per octave or cycles per hertz. And they've done it in a really strange way. So, and they've also used, um, well they're actually using multiple sinusoids, many of them, about 100 sinusoids, and all this intermodulation going on as well. So some of these things do need to be revisited to say, you know, what is, how, is there any particular modulation rates you should really try and avoid trying to reduce in your game control and or your, your processing and your hearing. Mm -hmm. right. Sounds yeah. In the, um, sorry, <laughs> in, in the, <laughs> jumped in there. In the, um, the idea that you've got this modulation masking and that's you know, doing most of the masking and you've got some sort of um, noisy background. I mean, presumably, you go along with the idea that some kind of modulation filtering, uh, that certain modulation frequencies can interfere yes. yeah. with your speech. Um, so, so a, another way of, of, of sort of extending this research, I suppose, is to see: is it the case that this, the advantage you get from this coherent slow modulation that you impose on the master, mm -hmm. does that only occur when there's actually a, a, a direct overlap between the modulation? Of the, of the masker and the well, signal, yes. or is it for any kind of modulated masker? You see what I mean? Yes. Yes. So, so, so it would be a kind of an interest, another interesting test of, of that. Um, yes. Hypothesis. Well, Brian was muttering about doing sort of you know, using octave bands of noise to modulate the the, the sinusoid. So you're sort of, so, so you're trying to see how, is there remote masking, or is it really right. confined to what we think of as being about an octave wide? modulation filter. Uh, that was one suggestion. Um, there's, there's actually in the paper, there's, there's quite a bit of other things in there in terms of um, that actually showing, because what we, did, we also did, if you want to go above 16 hertz, which is what I did there, mm. the trouble is, is the auditory, you, you can't use that technique down at low frequencies because the, um, the auditory filters are too narrow and you start getting beating between the, the sinusoids even though when, when, they're, when, yeah, when they're a nerve and a bit apart. You try to put a 20 hertz modulator on, you move, the, the things start crossing back over again. So you have to get rid of the low frequency channels which aren't wide enough, so you essentially high pass filter the speech and your mask mm. and repeat the experiment. Mm. And we've done that up to 81 hertz with this technique, which means that you either high pass from about 700 hertz or high pass from about 1400 hertz. Mm. And basically, you never, it, gets, it gets far worse, that, is that you never see any release from masking with those high modulation rates. It's quite hard to do. But it actually seems to imply that actually the, those low modulation rates <coughs> um, really are helping you in the low frequency channels really quite, quite, quite drastically. And in, um, and in fact, when you, when you yes, and when you, and, when, and I've overlapped it between in the high pass conditions, so some of the low modulation rates appear in the high pass. Yeah. And what you see is there's more masking, but there's more, no less risk from masking, so it's a long way, it goes a long way implying that actually the modulation rates are being more interfering at the, um, 
are, are more necessary than low frequency, less interfering if you've got low frequency channels. But if they're there in the high frequency channels, they're really quite interfering with you. So there's an across frequency apparent variation in the effectiveness. So, so, so you're saying that, if, if, if I understand this correctly, that, that you're using, in terms of the speech signal, you're using information from high modulation where it's more in the high frequency, you're actually using that information in no. high frequency channels, is that right? Yes, I suppose, yes, I suppose, yes, I suppose that because you're getting more interference. Yeah. Yes, from the, the modulator than you can press on, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good way of putting it. I haven't put that one. <laughs> you sit staring at the data and you think, oh, yes, I mean, you know, the, the, whole, well, the whole data sets in there, but it's, um, it's quite hard to interpret, actually. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, it does prompt the questions like you're saying about. And then the other one, of course, is you know, like the coherence of the modulation across frequency. Because uh, <coughs> Howell and Rosen did one where they actually had what they call checkerboard models. So they've mm. done spectrotemporal holes. So, so it looks like, in frequency space, it looks like you've, you've got squares because they yeah. get rid of local bits of time and frequency. Mm. And it's called checkerboard models. And once you have more than about four um, bands across frequency, you, it, the, the noise behaves as a steady noise. So I mean, that's. That's another thing that I feel like so clear, so I don't have to really want to go back and revisit. Is right. that because you had the, the noises from the modulations from what you're doing on there, or was it truly a four channel limit really? Yeah. Okay. Richard, thank you. Um, I was just um, wondering about, I'm not sure I can get my head around this, but in, if you had uh, sensory neural hearing loss, you'd expect broader frequency selectivity. Mm -hmm. How would that impact on? The measurement you've been doing in not when normal hearing loss and so is it sort of going to make well it, it, you get work, so. I mean the trouble is that the first bit all this dichotic presentation is a purely theoretical thing it's totally impractical for the real world although people have in the past done signal processing strategies where you take a signal and you try to put it alternate bands to each ear but then you lose spatial cues so in theory you're trying to not to overload the individual channels of the broad and ultra filter but actually you've lost so much to the other things in the real world that it never really took off as an idea. Um, so if you've got a single source of noise and you want to separate it, maybe it's better. It's a bit like the co two cochlear implants special in one, because if you've got patchier survival, then you'll be able to synergy type effect by not overloading the, the channels. But so in that sense, you know, it is slightly dry in terms of it being a you know something that you can't really do in the real world. But well, it is it's the, the, the earlier version of this was even drier. But <laughs> <laughs> you got the wetter one. But the, um, but the, the point, but the thing, but I think it's the, the conclusion about it's these modulations that are really probably causing the problem, and it's trying to keep the modulations under control. But it's something that we really do need to look at for hearing prosthesis and those other few words. And to a certain extent, it's something that I mean, I've made 25 years living out of this because <coughs> when I first arrived, joined Brian Moore's group. They had this two channel agency, the very slow acting agency at about five seconds time constants. <coughs> and everyone goes, Why do you want to do that? And then but you give the age to people, and they come back, and they haven't changed it from the settings they gave, you gave them. And they go, Well, I felt like I got my hearing back. It was something flat 60 dB loss. Um, you gave them a slow agency, and they're slightly elderly, slightly confined to home. And they're really happy with it because there wasn't too much going up and down all the time. And you know, Brian's group has been saying, you can have fast fluctuations, Stuart Gatehouse says you can, with certain people who are mentally agile, but with other people, you can't. Um, it's, it's the whole slow versus fast debate is, you know, still rumbles on, but um, we're getting some better ideas as to just what, is the, you know, what are the problems, what are the issues, and, uh, which are more than just the technology, which is why, you know, hat off to Stuart Gatehouse, fantastic work in 2004, and then the uh, Bernstein and Grant, um, there was another one as well, Bernstein and Brungard as well where they've really nailed it on the head, saying if you, if you measure hearing impaired people at the same sort of um, intelligibility point by adjusting the word set size, you actually can get a mask of this in hearing impaired people. So the previous non-existence and the problem that everyone was chasing was actually due to poor science. So they've nailed that bit on the head. Um, yeah. And then this one nails it, well, nails, it, nails it on the head for normal hearing people. Like normal hearing people are getting, don't do mask of this one. There is still a difference between normal and hearing impaired if you measure at the same standards, right? It's just not as big as, as, as we thought it was. Um, Agnes Laser has got a, yes. um, a paper on this, what can, you know, sort of 
almost a meta-analysis. Yes, yeah. there, there, and we, we've, we've, we've done something as well, basically showing there's a small, there's a deficit in the modulation processing, so they never quite benefit as much as the normal hearing people do. But mm -hmm. in fact, in the previous we saying they don't get any benefit, mm -hmm. but Agnes is one of the people who showed what they do, and all these other papers do as well. Okay, thanks very much. Thank that's, you. A, that's a great point, Jane. Okay, thanks everyone.